Our next presenter is Joelle Pinot. Joelle is professor at McGill, also heads up FAIR Montreal. Joelle's research has been in planning, learning, and decision making, also in mobile robotics, human robot interaction, dialogue, and adaptive treatment design. And today she'll tell us about uh, reproducibility in reinforcement learning. Please join me in welcoming Joelle. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have uh, started being very interested in uh, recent months around, about this question of how do we uh, set about um, developing the standards that we need such that the research that we're producing is reproducible in a way that we can actually build on this and hopefully progress more efficiently. Um, in the spirit of uh, NIP's workshops of ancient days, um, I would say most of the work that I'm presenting today is unpublished. Um, some of it has appeared on archive. A lot of it is uh, very fresh, hot, um, hot the press. And so it's a new set of slides, a new set of results. So I'm very much uh, welcoming the opportunity to discuss this after the presentation today. Um, digging into the question a little bit further, uh, it's in useful at times to actually think of what we mean by reproducibility in research. So I went digging for various notions of reproducibility in science more broadly than in machine learning strictly and found this one proposed by the uh, NSF in 2015 whereby reproducibility refers to the ability of a researcher to duplicate the results of a prior study using the same materials as were used by the original investigator. Reproducibility is a minimum necessary condition for a finding to be believable and informative. And so this quest for reproducibility and the awareness of the importance of reproducibility in research isn't something um, that is unique to machine learning. In 2016, the journal uh, Nature ran a survey of 1,500 uh, scientists across several fields asking them whether they thought there was a reproducibility crisis in their areas of science. And a significant number of them, 52%, said that yes, there was a significant crisis. Um, another number, 38%, said there was a slight crisis. You know, 3% said no, not much of a crisis. And a number of them didn't quite seem to know what was going on. A second set of questions was asked following this. And this question was, have you ever failed to pre reproduce an experiment? And they asked them both, did you fail to reproduce one of your own experiments? Or did you fail to reproduce someone else's experiment? And so the results were quite, quite telling. Um, it, it seems the chemists are having the hardest time at this. With a large number of them, almost 90% of the cases, it had happened, I'm not saying 90% of the experiments, but 90% of the, for the chemists, they had had some case where they were unable to reproduce someone else's experiment. And if I look closely, it's small on my screen, 60% or so um, reported having been unable to reproduce one of their own experiments. They didn't break out the data for computer scientists. We fall in the other category, um, which may be doing a little bit better than the chemists, but probably not as well as we would hope to do. Um, so I had the opportunity um, last weekend to be at a workshop um, sponsored by CIFAR, and I had 20 or so of our colleagues uh, captured in a room, and I asked them the question in an anonymous manner. Um, how many of you think that there may be a reproducibility crisis in machine learning? And this is the CIFAR program on learning in machines and brains. Um, and out of these 20 participants, 45% of them indicated that they thought there was a slight crisis, 35% thought there was a significant crisis, um, and again, about 10% each thought there was no crisis or weren't quite sure what was going on. Um, so it seems we're not quite immune to this uh, phenomenon. I went further and asked them the question, have you failed to reproduce an experiment? And here it was very interesting. We see much more differentiation between whether it had failed to reproduce someone else's experiment. In this case, about 80% of them reporting that that had happened to them. Um, in terms of whether they failed to reproduce one of their own experiment, they were down to about 5%. Um, and so that may be symptomatic. I will not go into very deep hypothesis about why there's such a difference in our field versus another. I will be maybe, you know, optimistic and say that um, compared to these other scientists, we actually are in a much better position to do reproducibility in that for the most part, we are running code on computers. 
and therefore it should be a lot easier in terms of an experimental setup than some of the other fields such as chemistry and so on. Um, I started digging a little bit more to figure out what might be the criteria for reproducibility and I came across this quote that I found quite telling, especially on the eve of NIPS, said the following, an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself, it is merely the advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment and the complete set of instructions which generated the figures. And so I take this as inspiration for our field um, as we move forward. My particular expertise is um, actually in reinforcement learning and this interest in reproducibility came really from my students in many ways. I saw them struggle over and over again to build on results that were in the literature um, and we decided to document that struggle in a bit of a more formal way. Um, and so most of the results I present today that apply to reinforcement learning come from the work um, of Peter Henderson, Riyashat Islam, graduate students at McGill University, and the, the results are presented in a paper that's going to be um, appearing at AAAI this winter, and it is on archive already. Um, backing up from the work that they did and the particular experiment that they did, I want to sort of consider a little bit more carefully what it means for reproducibility in reinforcement learning. I did say we had an edge compared to these other scientists, sciences in terms of being able to run an algorithm on a computer. And so in that sense, we should be in a better position to reproduce a lot of results. But it turns out it's not that easy. There's a lot of other information that often comes into play. And so David gave us a beautiful description of the work that was done on AlphaGo. And it would be a little bit simplistic to say that to reproduce AlphaGo, all we would need is necessarily the code and um, the machine, in, in effect, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into producing a system of that magnitude. There's the expertise, of course, from the experts, and there's, of course, um, the ability to play the game against human experts, which may not be accessible to everyone. And so there's a lot of pieces of the scientific um, inquiry that come into play if we really want to be able to do reproduction of some work. And I would say one of the things that I think we have to be careful of as a field is to set us up in a way that we can do this as much as possible um, and that in some cases some of the results that we're seeing are absolutely impressive, magnificent results, um, but we have to figure out also um, how to have a way to have access to the blueprints such that we actually know what we are building on as a science. And so in some ways, you know, I'm taking AlphaGo as an example, but it is but one of the cases where I think this reflection applies. Um, we have a part of the blueprints. Um, we have some of the papers that go into quite a bit of detail into how the method was conceived of on the algorithmic level. There's quite a lot of information, but there may still be a lot of the information that is missing to allow um, people to reproduce the work, in particular the access to the data itself, the access to the expert, which may be hard for some of us to contact, the access to the code, the specific hyperparameter setting, the computer, the magnitude of computational infrastructure that might be necessary for some of these results, and in particular, the evaluation setup. Um, and so, as much as I think we have to be in awe of some of the monumental progress that has been achieved in reinforcement learning, I think we also have to be sensitive to the younger population um, and avoid um, putting them in front of these monuments of research and asking them to produce research um, that is, uh, in some sense, you know, a little bit more difficult if we don't have all the ingredients that we need to enable reproducibility. And so I'm hoping that as we move forward as a community, as a field, we have a little bit more of these eureka moments where students are able to very easily and successfully, not just students, uh, everyone in the community, but replicate these results um, and lower the bar to that level of reproducibility. There's been a lot of efforts. I haven't, I'm not by any means the only one who has been um, talking about this issue and the community has done a lot to improve our ability to do reproducible research in reinforcement learning, in particular in the last few years. Um, the availability of the arcade learning environment in many ways I think was one of the reasons for the 
big progress in reinforcement learning that we saw in the last few years. The fact that this was a suite of environment, very rich, but that anyone could essentially have access to have you, and use and um, build on in their own research. Um, the availability of the Mojoko set of tasks was also very useful. And in some sense, I think the four that I illustrate here, also the robot soccer platform and the ELF multi-agent platform that was presented earlier today at NIPS, um, are very interesting because they have different facets of the problem. So in some cases, there's very rich observational domains. In some cases, we have continuous control casts. In other cases, we have actually physical systems. In the last case, we actually have the ability to test out multi-agent systems. And so by having a variety of platforms on which we can do research and which we can share between labs, we have really made a lot of progress in terms of enabling the reproducibility of research in this particular area. In the results that I'm going to present in the, the second half of the, the discussion today, I'm actually going to be building primarily on tasks um, having to do with the Mujoko environment. And so just a little bit of context, in, in a sense, you don't need to know a lot of reinforcement learning. I hope to appreciate um, today's talk. Um, a little bit of context in terms of the setup that we're going to assume for some of our experiments. Um, we are looking at tasks where, um, that are primarily solved by policy gradient methods. So the Mujoko domains have these sort of animated characters where you have to actually figure out the right policy to move the character along. And so in these policy gradient methods, typically we're interested in uh, finding a policy. I'm using pi to denote the policy. That policy is parameterized by a set of parameters denoted by theta. And what we're interested in finding is a policy pi which maximizes the return. And so rho indicates the return for a particular set of parameters theta condition on a particular initial state S0. And because it's a policy gradient method, we actually look at the gradient of the return with respect to the parameters. And so that gradient is taken over here, and we take into account the, um, the expected value over here with respect to the distributions of states. And so there's different variants of that general idea. And I don't necessarily want to go too much into the specific variants, but it includes variants that are on policy gradients and other methods that have a critic, and so actor critic methods that may have some off policy components. And the reason I look at this particular setup is because it's a type of method that has been used with quite a bit of success in recent years. Um, particularly in the last two or three years, and we've seen many papers come out which build on this general framework. And I'm not going to focus, in fact, so much on these new results. I'm going to focus a lot more on the policy gradient baseline methods which these results compare to. It gets quite interesting to see, in this case, how much the results are replicable in terms of the baseline results. Because in a sense, these are reused in many different papers in many different cases. And so the baseline algorithms I'll be using for the purposes of um, today's talk are the four following uh, algorithms, some of which have already made an appearance in the session today. TRPO and PPO, which is a variant of TRPO, both very popular as baseline methods when people produce new papers on policy gradient methods. The DDPG approach, also very popular recently. And the um, actor critic KTR approach, which was, I believe, presented uh, at NIPS this week. And so these are sort of my baseline methods which I'm interested in comparing, just for the reference. Um, but as you, we go along, which is, which is not going to matter all that much to my message. So let's consider applying these four different algorithms, in this case on a particular task from the Mujoko simulator. This is the Hopper task, I believe, another half cheetah task in the, which we have the results. And based on this, I'm not even telling you which algorithm is which. What we're observing is that the, the red algorithm seems to be really doing much better than some of the other algorithms, albeit with quite a bit of variance. And so, so it's maybe unclear whether it's actually a very um, robust method. And so you may be tempted after seeing results like this, I hope you're tempted to look at another domain or two and see how well these methods are doing, these four algorithms which we're comparing. These are the four algorithms listed here, these four algorithms which we're comparing on some other domains. And so you go about trying another domain, you try out, in this case, the hopper domain and the swimmer domain, and you get these results. Now the, col the colors are consistent from one algorithm to another. It's a little bit difficult to figure out what to conclude, right? 
Um, in some cases, you know, the red seems to be doing a lot better, but then you look at how it's doing on the other two domain and it's quite terrible. Um, blue seems to be doing a lot better on the swimmer, a lot worse on half cheetah. That's not that surprising, right? In some cases, you may not expect an algorithm to do best on all of the different domains. But in this case, these are pretty close domains, right? They're not all that different in terms of the type of structure. The observation space is the same. The action space is similar. Not always the same dimension, but similar. Um, we went digging in a little bit deeper than that. In fact, you know, one of these methods is TRPO. I won't tell you which. And we weren't quite sure we were getting the best result we could out of our TRPO method. And so we went digging for other code. And thankfully, um, the authors of the TRPO methods, as well as other groups, have made different code bases available for this. So it was reasonably easy to do. And we found three different code bases for TRPO. And these are the results we got. So, so we're a little bit puzzled. In particular, we're a little bit concerned because different papers in the literature which were using TRPO as a baseline were using different one of these code bases. It's not like everyone agrees to use the blue one and the other two are deprecated. We actually picked those three because they had been used as baseline reference algorithms in recent papers. So you thought, ooh, wow. We did the same thing with DDPG implementations. Went looking around three different DDPG implementations, none of them our own, um, that were released. So it's not just one type of approach. It's a little bit difficult to figure out what to do. Um, we went looking a little bit further in, and we started playing, for example, with some hyperparameters of these methods. And what we observed that there's in fact a very intricate interplay between the hyperparameters. That in and of itself is not completely surprising. Anyone who's done deep learning in the last few years is well aware of this phenomenon. Um, the part that may be a little bit problematic is the level of motivation of the experimenter to find the particular combination that is winning when dealing with the baseline. The level of motivation seems to always you know, lack a little bit when it comes to finding the best hyperparameter for the baselines. Um, in this case, the type of hyperparameters that we're uh, changing are, for example, the um, parameters of the policy network, the number of nodes, number of layers, and so on. And so that's one that people are reasonably used to optimizing over. Um, we looked a little bit more um, and looked at a hyperparameter, which is the reward scaling. So you may not know, but when you do reinforcement learning, it's often the case that the magnitude of the reward gets rescaled before feeding into the algorithm. It has become standard practice, and in some cases there's very good reason to do so. There's papers that demonstrate that when you do the scaling appropriately, you get much more stable learning. Um, again, not a bad thing to do. It turns out that there's a lot of interplay between how you do your reward scaling and whether you use layer-wise normalization. And so once again, if you're not sufficiently motivated to find the right combination, you may come up with very, very different results for your baseline results. Um, it's not just the hyperparameter optimization that had us a little bit concerned. Um, we got very interested in how people measure performance for their policies. Um, in most of the graphs I've presented so far, the way that we've measured performance is based on the return averaged over several trials. And we've included a standard deviation over that, uh, over the set of returns. But we found a lot of papers who report the K best returns. And so presumably they have run a lot of trials and then they found a small number, K being three or five, and produced the results for that. And it's not always clear how many trials were run to pick the set of K. Um, so we looked at some of the papers, um, and in this case, you know, they were producing results from maybe the top five. So that's the K best trials. They, I don't know how many they ran, but they report results for the top five. Um, other of them report results for three, five, top two, top three. Um, and so in this case, I would suspect that perhaps we're not getting a very full picture of the performance of the algorithm under different conditions. Um, and in this case, I've blotted off the author name because quite honestly, I'm 
I'm not so interested in uh, pointing figures on specific work because quite honestly this practice is very widespread. It's not a single group, it's not a single set of results that are doing this. It is so widespread that it's become the standard way of producing the results for this area of uh, research which I personally find a little bit concerning and so <laughs> I think I'm trying to uh, see as a community whether we want to continue in this direction or perhaps realign our practices. Um, it, because we were picking the top few trials, it, it became interesting to think about how are we picking those K-best ones. And so um, the, the students ran one more experiment, and, and this is a particular cute one. They produce results from two different, we'll call them two different methods, the orange method and the blue method. In this case, they did five runs of each, right? There has a lot of paper that do five runs. They didn't pick the top five, they just did five of one and five of the other. And they showed me these results and we looked at them and we're thinking, yep, orange is doing a lot better than blue on this. And then they revealed that in this case, both orange and blue were five runs of the same TRPO code with the same hyperparameter configuration. And so just presumably the choice of the random seed in this case was the dominating factor explaining the difference in performance between the two approaches. So, I think there's some things that we can do, in particular in reinforcement learning, but also more broadly in machine learning, to improve our ability to have good results on which we can build and which we can trust. Um, I have uh, made, in this case, mostly the focus on reproducibility in some discussions, the question of whether there was a difference between reproducibility and replication came up. Um, I would say, uh, I went digging a little bit for definitions, um, and replicability is typically assumed to be a stronger concept than reproducibility. In this case, a, repro a rep study is deemed to be replicable if we can actually collect the data in the same way, we can perform the same data analysis, and then we get to the same conclusions. Um, and so most of the work which I presented today, the notion of collecting the data in the same way is not necessarily problematic as long as we have all of the information. But as we move away from simulation domain and into domains where we're actually using real world data and collecting real world data, then this notion of whether we can actually replicate the collection of the data itself becomes an interesting factor in terms of um, seeing what we know about the work. As I was thinking through this work, I started thinking quite actively about what were the right metrics for reproducibility? What were the ways to measure whether we were um, in fact on the right track with respect to this? So I came up with a set in discussion with many other people that seemed to give me a good target in terms of reproducibility. So the first few items are things that most people um, we think about quite readily. It is really useful if we can have the exact data set or the exact simulation environment in which a work was produced. So that's very useful information. Um, very useful if we can have the right train, validate, and test partitions, especially for work on supervised learning. Sometimes this information is missing from papers. Um, it's very useful, of course, if we can have the implementation, some executable files, particularly the version number of the dependencies can be very useful, as well as, of course, an account of all the hyperparameters used. I would add to that a specification of the random seeds, in particular in cases where a small number of results have been produced. Um, in many cases, it is surprising how there may be misalignment. In cases where we do have code, there may be a misalignment between the paper and the code. And so ideally, from the code, we should be able to go all the way to generating the actual figures that are in the paper should be very good alignment about this. The clarity of the code, the clarity of the paper in terms of ease of understanding, language and so on is of course a factor. Um, a third set of factor I would say some details on the computing infrastructure used. It doesn't mean everyone will have access to that infrastructure but at least knowing what is that infrastructure would be helpful. Some information about the computation requirements in terms of time, memory, the number, the types of machines that were used. Um, and finally, some indication on the re-implementation effort. So in a case where someone's trying to re-implement the work, figuring out can this be done in a short amount of time, do we need a lot of time, what's the expertise level of the person doing the re-implementation that is necessary to reproduce the work. 
And finally, in some cases, um, for people who engage in this work of trying to reproduce previous work, right? how many and how complex are your interactions with the authors until you are able to reproduce the results that are actually in the paper? And perhaps um, this goes a bit beyond reproducibility, but can we actually see if the conclusions generate to other data sets beyond those that are strictly in the paper? So I think this gives us, you know, maybe a, something to shoot for in terms of what we want to see in our field to make sure that we are really adhering to good principles. Um, because last weekend I had my, you know, captive uh, audience of CIFAR Learning and Brain members, I actually extended the survey a little bit more, asked them a few more questions. I asked them, like, amongst this whole set of different things, right, which ones do you think are very important for reproducibility, which one are important, which one are not so important? So it was on a scale of one to five, where five was the most important um, and one's the least important. And here are the things that they thought were really important. So 16 out of 20 said the account of all hyperparameters is really important. Four out of 20 said, yeah, that's important. So that's like all 20 of them were in agreement on hyperparameters. 19 out of 20 thought it was very important or important to have the exact data sets in the simulation environment. 18 thought we needed clear code and paper. Um, and 16 thought we needed train, validate, and test partitioning information. So these came out as the most salient features in terms of what we need. In terms of um, what else do we need, right, uh, nine of them thought it was very important and six of them thought it was important that we had the implementation or the execution file, so that's 15 out of 20. Um, again, 16 thought we should have some alignment between the paper and the code. 16 thought we should know what's the re-implementation effort necessary. And then the other factors were deemed to be less important, according to them. Again, very, very small sample size. I'm not really trying to um, make a statement on the basis of just that. Though if the survey appears at some point to a broader population, I encourage you to, you know, tell me what you think. Um, but some of these other pieces people thought was less important in terms of really doing reproducibility. Um, a couple quick notes. Um, I'm not alone in this, and there's a lot of people who have built a lot of infrastructure to facilitate reproducibility, so I encourage you to explore some of these infrastructures for your own research, um, adhere to them if you can, both in terms of as a research sharing the results of your research and also building on the results of other researchers' results. Um, about a month and a half ago, I launched an effort called the iClear 2018 Reproducibility Challenge. Um, it is a call for the community to participate in essentially a crowdsourcing reproducibility effort whereby people are encouraged to pick a paper submitted into iClear 2018 and try to reproduce that paper. Um, I have tasked the graduate students in my graduate course to do so, and there's 10 other institutions across the world that are doing the same, so there's a good set of students doing that um, right now, and as a result of this effort, I have encouraged them to post on the open review the results of their reproducibility studies um, with all the challenges and flaws that that uh, may entail. How many people here submitted an iClear paper this year? Raise your hands. How many of you have made code available in an anonymous fashion? I see four hands in that whole big room. It is not too late. Um, the students have until December 15 um, in my course and a little bit later in some of the other courses. Um, and of course, this is just one drop in an ocean of effort towards doing that. So please. Try to remember in future efforts what you can do to help that. Um, it's probably an experiment that we will repeat um, in future, in the future as well. So just a couple last note, right? I think uh, as a community, um, we can do better uh, in terms of experimental practice, in terms of how we report our results, in terms of how we share our results. Um, and so I'm encouraging everyone to do so. If you have some availability or some of your students do to get involved in the reproducibility challenge, maybe you want to do like a 48-hour hackathon in your lab on the uh, heels of NIPS related to this. Um, and I think, you know, as a community, we should really commit to reporting accurately on our methods, to releasing code, and to reproducing results because it is so important to the advancement of our knowledge. Um, this work was made possible, of course, by some fantastic collaborators, Peter Henderson, Riyashat Islam on the RL Reproducibility 
for the eye clear reproducibility, I have Hugo La Rochelle, Rosemary Hernanke, and Jen B. Fried who are helping me out. And many students in the Reasoning and Learning Lab have contributed to this, um, to this work. Thank you very much. Peter says I can take a question or two. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is about open source versus closed source for uh, different aspects, like for example, the simulator. I know that Mujoco, for example, while it's helpful, could also be expensive uh, for site licenses, for example. Yeah, so if, if a simulator is available, but it, you have to pay for it, I mean, what is the reasonable way to look at that, in your opinion? If a simulator is available and we have to pay, what's the accessibility level of that? If in some cases the amount of computation you need is very, very expensive also, um, uh, there's a challenge there. I would say it's, um, it's a challenge in which we are not alone. If you look at some other disciplines, for example, in physics, um, they have initiatives that require very, very expensive equipment. And one of the ways that they have put in place to sort of ensure sort of the sanity checking of their experiment is to make sure that there were several groups involved in conducting and reviewing the experiment. And so in some cases, this may be the kind of work, the kind of setup that we have to explore as a community if we want to move faster. So I've seen a lot of presentations here that did have a GitHub link in the slides, but that kind of moves us to the next problem, which is it's not always easy to reproduce the results just w from having the code. And sometimes the amount of time and effort as an author that it takes to support someone else using your code can be quite high. So um, I'm wondering if there's a way we can sort of incentivize people to dedicate time to doing that. Mm. I think that's definitely true. Um, both as an author and as someone who wants to reproduce results, the cost can be quite high. Um, in many ways, the, the, the reproducibility challenge and the way we've launched it with some students, right, it, it aligns the incentive. The students are kind of incentivized to uh, do good work because it's a course project um, and don't need to be prompted as much as uh, someone else. Um, but I would say that it still, it still remains a challenge. Um, there's, I think, because what I've described has a sort of a wider set of criteria for reproducibility that includes the ease of reproducibility. So I think it's a factor, perhaps not the only, definitely not the only one, but it's definitely a factor. I think code gives us something extra, but that's not all. In many cases, we need much more than that. I think I've had a lot of suggestions since I started talking about this of people who, to help incentivize things even further to convince people to do it. So I think we're, we have some mechanism to explore to do that. Thank you for your talk. I think this is a huge problem in our field. I don't have the computational resources to reproduce many of the big results in our field, so I make up my own way to scale it down, everyone else does, and then we end up with results like you presented. What should we do about this? Yeah, so... In many cases, right, it, it may not be necessary to reproduce everything. W one of the, I would say, one of the results that, uh, that's interesting is, um, in many cases, even reproducing the baseline can be really, really useful to our knowledge. And that's maybe a really good step to, for people who have less access to resources, to just sort of be the inspector, an experimental inspector that the baselines were well done. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> One could argue that on a long enough time horizon, work that's fundamentally non-reproducible non disappears. Um, you know, you might get some citations for a year or two, but as far as advancing human knowledge goes, if, if a work is not reproducible, uh, it, it goes away. Um, have you... I, this is one of those questions, but it's actually just me telling, <laughs> saying my ideas. Uh, uh, is it possible to turn that into an incentive to motivate people to create work that's more reproducible? Yes, to... To create work that's more reproducible, yeah. I mean, I think I agree with you that in some cases, right, the work just the goes away, and what we'd like is that it goes away a little faster. 
yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so I think there's many things that are in the air to see whether we can do that, um, whether you know we have some track and some conferences that are dedicated to work that is reproducible and to publish there. You both have to propose a paper and verify one. I think some of these things are being discussed. They take a, quite a bit of a change and they take quite a bit of people infrastructure to put them in, uh, in place. So we'll see what happens. Thanks. If people want to get involved, I think there's a lot we can do. We lost our question on that side. Um, so I, it's really a question for you. I wanted to ask because it seems to me, echoing what someone said earlier, that there is actually a cost to making um, things as reproducible as we can. I think, first of all, actually, there's a lot of goodwill, and I think that actually most researchers are trying their hardest to make their research reproducible. Um, and so I think we should encourage those people to, um, I, I think, actually offering good guidelines of how to make it more reproducible is a great idea, and I think that's a really good benefit of your talk. But the cost is when you have work which is when you're asking for people to put code out there which needs to be made public and usable and friendly for anyone else to use, um, that can take a lot of effort. And I worry that we'll actually push people away from publishing, um, particularly people who are in industry who have kind of proprietary code bases and things like this. Um, it might actually have a negative impact on... So, for example, for AlphaGo, you asked about AlphaGo. I think we, we tried our hardest to, to make that work reproducible. Um, but if we'd been forced to make the code um, shareable, it probably would have taken us an additional year, I would estimate, and so we wouldn't have published. Um, and so then the question is, um, are we pushing people away from publishing? And I think, in reality, the work was reproduced. In fact, within two months of the most recent paper, there is a, a, a reproduction of it. Um, there's people who've reproduced it online in various regards. So I think the, the, my question for you is, like, where's the trade-off? How do you get the trade-off right between pushing people to do the right thing, um, but not pushing them so hard that they feel that, that actually there's a burden on every paper now, which is so great that, that it's actually unrealistic. And mm -hmm. I think some of these requirements do start to border on, the, on, on, on maybe going that, that way. Yeah, I, 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 I agree that there, you know, the, the, there's, a, the, the, there's, a, the, there's a high bar in terms of the requirement, in terms of what I'm proposing here. Um, I think in some sense the recipe is to have many different modes to diffuse knowledge, right? And so there may be some venues in which a very high standard is required in terms of reproducibility, and there may be other venues where it's a different standard in terms of what type of work is accepted and the way it's disseminated. And so I'm not arguing that only one, one this, this standard needs to be applied to all work. Um, e all the time. I just think that work that meets that standard, we have a higher level of confidence in terms of the knowledge. Okay. Thank you. I think, we, I think we need to wrap up here for this session. Let's thank Joelle again. Thanks. And we'll restart at 10 past 4.